Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming here today to learn a little bit more about Swift for TensorFlow. So as a first question, to get a, a little bit of an idea on what everybody's background um, happens to be, how many of you are machine learning engineers? A couple of hands? All right. How many of you have to deal with the outputs of machine learning engineers in, in software applications and production deployment settings? Cool. And how many of you saw like salaries for machine learning engineers and got very excited about it <laughs> and, and came here today? Because because that is uh, like that was that was one of the most interesting things to me. Um, I've been um, as kind of a background. Uh, my name is Paige Bailey. I've been doing machine learning for a little bit over a decade now, though I started with traditional machine learning before going into deep learning specifically. Um, and when I started doing it, it wasn't called uh, data science or machine learning at all. It was, it was called research. Um, and you just had massive amounts of data that you were looking for statistically relevant samples. Um, and then trying to use that data to understand and to make predictions about behaviors and systems um, in the future, potentially. Uh, so I, I worked at NASA for a couple of summers doing research um, there on lunar ultraviolet. Uh, I'm currently at Google working with Chris Latner, who's responsible for the Swift programming language, um, LLVM, a whole bunch of work on Clang. Uh, and my background is not machine learning at all, it's geophysics and applied math. Uh, so started off uh, doing work in the oil industry um, until I realized that people would also pay me money to program computers and that was, that was a bit more delightful. Um, and I also had no experience with Swift before working on this project. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's been nice to be able to transition back to the structure of a typed language as opposed to working with Python. So uh, though Python does have a, a number of benefits, which we'll touch on um, in this presentation as well. So another question, how many of you are familiar with Swift? Several hands. And how many of you work primarily in Python? One hand, cool. So, so I'm preaching to a choir, this is great. Um, and with that, I will get started. So an outline for today, we're gonna talk a little bit about what Swift for TensorFlow is and what it is not. So it is not just another language binding for TensorFlow. Um, it is actually a reimagining of the complete framework. Um, and that gives us a, a number of benefits, um, particularly in production settings and particularly in terms of performance. So you might be interested to learn a little bit more there. We're also going to talk about why Swift in particular is useful for deep learning um, and give you some resources to how you can get started if you want to begin programming um, with, uh, with Swift, especially in a machine learning context. So machine learning and deep learning in particular have kind of exploded in popularity over the last several years. Um, and you, we've seen uh, models starting to be integrated into every possible deployment target. So in browsers or in mobile devices. Um, and this is obviously true in uh, sort of computer vision tasks. Like I think everybody is familiar with hot dog, not hot dog sort of situations. Um, but also in really interesting uh, language, uh, sort of language tasks. So BERT um, is a great example of a, of a model that's been very popular in academic settings. It was originally released with TensorFlow on TPUs. Um, and then almost immediately it had another implementation running on GPUs and it's now being integrated into pretty much every product um, that we have at Google as well as a number of products at, at Microsoft um, and other, other technology companies as well. And it's great in that all of these models and all of these frameworks are open sourced so folks can use them uh, to meet the needs of their own businesses without necessarily having to rewrite the wheel. So instead of having to you know, hunt down the massive amounts of data that would be needed to train um, at, at, you know, at Google scale, um, you're able to take the model that has already been trained and minutely tweak it uh, to meet your use case. We've also seen uh, an explosion in terms of academic contexts, right? So, so the number of machine learning papers produced every day as of 2017 has surpassed Moore's law. 
Um, and if I uh, extended out this timeline to be 2008 and 2019, um, it would be even more impressive. Uh, the, 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 publication, um, the publication count for conferences is, is getting to be a little bit crazy. Like there's a conference each December called NeurIPS uh, that it sold out tickets in something like seven minutes last year, um, which is, you know, you would think that we had Beyonce coming to sing or something, um, but, but it was actually, uh, it was really dear to get a ticket. And this year it was so popular um, that every person who wanted to register for the conference had to uh, be put into a drawing pool um, to be considered for the, for the privilege of being able to pay money to, to go to this conference. Right, so so it's it's been awesome to see to see the interest um, and to see people get more and more enthusiastic about about building and deploying machine learning models. Um, but also, as a person who's been doing this for a little bit over uh, a little bit over ten years, it's a bit overwhelming in the sense that it did not used to be cool, and now it is. And and most of us are still trying to figure out how to cope. Um, We've also seen really impressive accuracy improvements over the years. Uh, and these step change improvements are brought on not by those minute tweaks that I was talking about before. So somebody releases BERT, you change the hyperparameters, or you, you have some uh, novel way to, uh, to understand embeddings or, or something. Um, but it's mostly through step change improvements and uh, sort of these algorithmic fusion techniques. So being able to have some sort of neural network that you marry, um, that you marry with like Monte Carlo tree search, uh, and uh, you you put these two together, and then suddenly voila, you have a five percent performance improvement. Um, and this this is great in the sense that um, you know you keep seeing these really interesting blends of uh, you know more uh, known and proven technologies with this new stuff. Um, but it also means that you need to be able to have a language that's capable of marrying those techniques, um, even though a framework hasn't really been solidified yet. So, um, so for example, a number of the high-level APIs that are used for deep learning projects, um, they're for very well-defined kind of out-of-the-box tasks, um, but they aren't really good at being uh, sort of stitched together and composed together and integrated, integrated effectively. Um, Google is also an AI-first company, right? So, so as we build out these models in Google Brain, um, we want to be able to deploy them as quickly as possible. Um, and that's not just for browser-based applications um, like Gmail or, or like YouTube, but also for things on mobile devices. So if any of you have a Pixel device, um, you might have noticed just recently that, uh, that sort of speech to text, being able to speak into your phone and have it immediately transcribed in English has gotten much faster. And that's because we've been able to take models, uh, quantize them, um, and then place them directly on mobile devices with super fast inference speed. So TensorFlow is running on every single one um, of your Pixel devices as well as every single Android device, which is kind of amazing. Um, but the, the, the crux is, Models are, are getting, uh, models are getting more and more ubiquitous. Um, the deployment scenarios are getting uh, more and more novel and complex, and performance is becoming increasingly important to the people who are building applications as well as the people who are using them. We've also got this cool stuff uh, for, for accelerated hardware in, in terms of training. Right? So what you see on the screen here are um, a collection of TPUs that we've produced over the years at Google, um, as well as a TPU pod scenario. Uh, these are really, really powerful, um, giving us the ability uh, to take a model that would have historically taken weeks to train, um, to be able to train it in a matter of minutes or hours. Um, and whenever you have this, as a, as a deep learning engineer or a machine learning engineer, you suddenly unlock all of these new possibilities, right? So instead of uh, having a rapid prototyping cycle that isn't super rapid, right? Like you, you have an idea and then three weeks later you figure out if it worked or not. Or more frustratingly, you have an idea, you attempt to prototype it, and then you realize you made some sort of code mistake um, and you find out three weeks later, frustratingly. Um, and have to restart all over again, um, you're suddenly getting a much, uh, much speedier feedback loop. And so you can try something, um, go and get a coffee, figure out if it worked, try something else, 
um, debug it a little bit, and then and they can get a new scenario. But all of this, uh, it is incredibly important that whatever language you use can communicate directly with TPUs, um, and that can be supported by something. Um, so TPUs use uh, a, a special format called bfloat16. Um, and being able to work with that effectively and being able to uh, directly interact with the architecture is increasingly important. So here I get to the point, right? So why Swift for TensorFlow? Um, all, of these, all of these constraints and frustrations that I've mentioned, um, how, does, how is Swift uniquely positioned to help machine learning engineers and their production teams be effective at deploying, um, at deploying their, their models? Um, and for this, I, I like to give sort of an anecdote of an example. This is from a book called Python Interviews. And it details uh, the story of a startup um, that was uh, like Google in its early days was really sort of continuously frustrated that this startup was able to have an idea and really rapidly prototype out a solution and deploy it before Google was even able to get to the first step using C++. Um, and it was, uh, you know, like they, they kept getting beat to market over and over and over again. Um, and it wasn't until they acquired this company um, called YouTube uh, and uh, sort of understood their code base that they realized that the reason that this company was able to, uh, to so quickly iterate and, and have a fast path to deployment because they were using Python, they weren't using C++. Um, it was just that simple language choice um, that, that made them so effective and, and made the, the sort of uh, deployment speed so rapid. And this is great if you're operating at a high level. Um, but what we see increasingly with these algorithmic fusion techniques is that people want to experiment with distributed training. Um, with reinforcement learning, it's, it's a given that you need to be able to have low-level control over the distribution techniques for your hardware. And you can't do that really effectively at a high level. You have to get a little bit lower. And if you get lower, you're probably using C++. And C++ isn't friendly. Like, it is not a fun language uh, to use. Like, it, it has a number of affordances which are really powerful, right? It's performant. You have types. Gosh, I love types. Um, Python, Python has introduced uh, sort of types as, as part of Python 3, but it's a little bit, um, it's still a little bit frustrating. Um, but regardless, uh, if you want to experiment at these lower levels, you need something that's just as performant, just as powerful, and just as uh, sort of interoperable as C++. Um, and historically, there hasn't been an option um, until Swift. So if you're, if you're wanting to try these, uh, these more novel deep learning step change improvement techniques, uh, Swift is a, is a great tool for you to explore. But what does it look like, you may ask? Like, you know, you're telling me it's just as speedy as C++. You're telling me that, uh, you're telling me that it uh, has C++ interop or C interop or Python interop. Like, what does it actually look like? And the good news is, uh, it looks a lot like Python. Uh, and coming from the Python world myself, um, uh, yeah, you might see a few more lets sprinkled in. You might see some curly braces. You might see some indications of types. But other than that, uh, it, you squint a little bit, and it looks like Python, um, which is really exciting. Um, it's very readable. Um, it's open sourced. Even though the language was started at Apple, it's sort of community driven. Um, and, it, and it gives you the ability to quickly prototype um, performant uh, production ready solutions very quickly. Um, if you want to implement a model, it looks a little bit like this. So an image classification model, um, if you import Swift for TensorFlow, um, you would create a model with a few layers. Uh, you have here a, a convolutional 2D layer, max pooling, um, and, some, uh, and some additional features. You would uh, preface a function with at differentiable. So with Swift for TensorFlow, any function um, is differentiable, regardless of whether it's related to machine learning or not. Um, so you could create any arbitrary function um, and be able to understand the change over time. And then you would set up this uh, TensorFlow context, um, and you're off to the races. It's actually really interesting to explore training a model um, so you have an optimizer, you have, uh, you have a couple of distributions, and then you just have a for loop where you can apply 
um, where you can apply your gradients and your, um, your sort of softmax cross entropy. If you look at the difference between the Swift implementation of a model um, and the Python implementation, uh, so on the bottom you have something from TensorFlow historically. Uh, you probably have seen the sort of canonical MNIST example from TF Keras. Uh, it, it looks almost the same, right? And it, it's actually kind of funny. Um, the Swift implementation has one line fewer than the Python implementation, at least in this example. Um, and this slide is taken from a course that was delivered by uh, Jeremy Howard and Chris Latner just recently. Jeremy Howard is the, one of the creators of FastAI with Rachel Thomas. Um, they've done great work building out really uh, sort of understandable high-level APIs in Python. Um, and the next iteration of Jeremy's course is, is taught in Swift. Uh, and he's actually implemented or re-implemented all of FastAI and Swift um, with the new name SwiftAI, which is delightful. Um, and also very punny, which I appreciate. Um, but yes, so implementing a model in Swift, implementing a model in Python looks pretty much the same, um, but dramatic performance and uh, sort of deployment um, considerations. Another nice thing about Swift, uh, so how many of you have looked at assembly recently? Uh, <laughs> More people than who use Python. This is great. <laughs> um, so, so what you see here um, is an example of, of a Swift function. Um, and it's uh, sort of it's, it's the same code implemented in assembly. And you see here that it is, it's very succinct, very clean. Um, whereas if you, were implementing, if you were implementing similar functionality in another language, uh, you would probably, uh, it would certainly not fit on a single slide. Um, but it's, it's great to be able to understand precisely, uh, precisely what is happening um, whenever you use Swift uh, to implement some function. Uh, Swift also often gets the, the sort of um, what's the, the sort of cutism of being syntactic sugar for LLVM, um, and and this is uh, it's, this is a great example of how compiler technology can really build powerful um, and performant code. So why Swift for machine learning? I've already explained a little bit about this, but uh, in case you weren't aware, Swift is cross-platform. Um, so this surprised me when I first started. Like, I, you know, you hear Swift and you're like, oh yeah, Apple thing. Like, it goes on the things with, that start with the i. Like it goes on the iPhones and the iPads and the such, but, and the Mac OSs and, and whatever. But it's actually, it can go anywhere C++ can go. So that means Linux, Mac OS, Windows, we do have support on all of those platforms. It also means Android and iOS devices, as well as embedded devices. Uh, there, was recently, um, there was recently a master's thesis proving that you could get the Swift binary size down uh, low enough to go on M-series embedded devices. Uh, which, is, which is really cool and also has a number of applications when you start thinking about sensor technologies being enabled by uh, deep learning models and things like factories or in cars. Um, it's also very syntactically similar to Kotlin. So if you're an Android developer um, and you know, your alternative is do you want to have a model that you deploy in your app and it's uh, implemented in Python um, or do you want to have something that looks a little bit similar to the language that you're already using um, then, then it's a little bit niftier. The other great thing is that if you have a model that's implemented in Swift, it compiles down to a .so file, um, and you can import that into your Android app, um, and you're off to the races again. You, it's, you'd use it just like any other library. Uh, so, so that's pretty cool. Um, it also has a focus on productivity and customizability, right? So typed APIs, static detection of errors, you get all of the nice uh, sort of developer tooling that you would see in C++ world, semantic aware autocomplete, which is uh, always a frustration for Python. Um, we have tooling at Google that allows you to uh, to sort of follow um, and trace back files as you're as you're programming, um, and it always kind of balks, at, especially at the init.py files. Um, but uh, being able to being able to follow things through is is quite important to us. Um, and then also customizable abstractions in user space. Uh, so, so all of these things combined um, make Swift really nice uh, for, developer, um, for developer tooling. There's also another project that was recently started by Chris uh, called MLIR. So how many of you have heard of MLIR? Excellent. So MLIR 
um, is an intermediate representation layer. ML does not stand for machine learning in this context, uh, but rather um, sort of multi-level um, intermediate representation letter, layer that builds on top of LLVM. And the idea for MLAR is that uh, sort of historically we've seen a number of issues with deploying to, uh, especially to mobile targets, um, but also just in general, right? So you might have a model that's been, uh, uh, that's been implemented in Python, um, and some of the ops are supported on new series devices. Um, but if you are using devices from circa 2010, um, many of those ops might not be supported. And you deploy your model, um, it either does not work as expected, um, or it fails silently, um, or it uh, just, uh, you know, it, it outputs uh, problematic results. And this isn't an artifact of, you know, the model not being created effectively. Um, it's an output of the device, the deployment target that you're putting it on, um, not being able to support some of that functionality. And this is ubiquitous across all kinds of computing, right? So not just machine learning, but everything. Um, we also have scenarios with TPUs where you have to have uh, software that's specifically architected to meet that hardware consideration. Um, and right now, the, the frustration for people who want to code for TPUs is that you have to, to sort of hand code everything to work effectively on, on those deployments. Um, MLAR is building out this mid-level representation um, that allows you to build a dialect uh, that would allow you to, to specify this kind of op can run on this kind of hardware architecture. And if it can, it will. And if it won't, it kicks it back to CPU. Um, so why is this important? This is important in the context of I could write a model using something called scikit-learn, um, which is a traditional machine, learning, uh, traditional machine learning framework implemented in Python. Um, and I could compile it down and run that model anywhere. Like it, could, uh, it could be deployed to a mobile device, and if there's an op in scikit-learn that could run on a GPU, it will. Um, and if it, if it can't, it just gets punted back. Um, and, but regardless, still continues to run. Or I could take that same model, put it on a TPU. I could take that same model, put it on you know, a cluster of CPUs, um, and the, the sort of distribution would be taken care of for me. Um, but it's really trying to abstract away all of the, the sort of pain of deployment um, from the people who are actually building software um, and trying to make it work in real life. So that's MLAR. I strongly suggest if you're interested in that topic, uh, to take a look at the MLAR special interest group. They have open design meetings every Friday uh, or every Thursday, and we have open design meetings for, for Swift um, every Friday. And the idea is that Swift is intended, just as it's syntactic sugar for LLVM, it's intended to be the same kind of syntactic sugar for MLAR going forward. It's also really exciting in that this keynote blog post that I've linked here, 95% um, of the world's uh, hardware manufacturers for data centers have signed on that they will agree to, um, to support MLAR. Um, so that's the Shilinks, the Qualcomm's, the NVIDIA's, the Intel's, those guys, uh, they're, they're all on board, which is exciting to see. And they're contributing code, which is also really cool. Swift also has great interop um, with uh, no wrappers. So you can just import any library from C and immediately use it. And this is partially because of the great work from the Apple team to, um, because they needed Swift to be able to be their replacement for Objective-C internally. Um, so C interop, at Google we've just implemented C++ interop. Um, so you can import any arbitrary C++ header, use it and extend it directly from Swift um, and still see the same performance benefits that you would see from C++, which is kind of magic. Uh, and it also means that if you have an existing code base filled with C++ or C, instead of having to rewrite everything in order to use this new language, you can just have an incremental, um, an incremental introduction of Swift as a technology. Uh, this, is, this is incredibly important um, in the sense that a lot of great code has been written, um, and it's really silly to, uh, to forego all of it um, just because, of, uh, just because of, of changing times. We also have Python interop. Uh, so a question I always get is, as a data scientist, you know, I'm very familiar with using NumPy, I love Matplotlib, you know, all of this great ecosystem of tooling that's been built around data science and machine learning. Um, 
with Python, you just import Python um, and you can use any library exactly the same as you would from your favorite interpreter. Right? So you can use NumPy, you can um, plot things out with matplotlib, uh, and it, it feels very natural. Um, and of course, you're, you're sort of limited in that Python is, is single-threaded, so you're at the mercy of the gill. Um, but, but other than that, uh, it's quite nice. We also give you the ability to create custom kernels. Um, and that is, wow, that, that, pi, that popcorn image took a whole long time to load. I wonder what the resolution is. Um, but, it, but it's infinitely hackable in terms of developing custom kernels. Um, this is an example of 1D average pooling. We also, uh, one of the prototypes that I was most excited about recently was giving users the ability to create custom CUDA kernels from directly inside a Jupyter notebook in Swift. Um, and if you've ever tried to do CUDA programming historically, it is not fun, um, but that made it look easy. So, so being, able to, being able to have these, these sort of new and novel techniques, um, we really think will enable some of those step change improvements and deep learning models that we were mentioning before. Cool. We've also integrated differentiable programming directly into the language and are in the process of upstreaming it back to Swift Core. So this gives you custom derivatives, user-defined types, um, and it's flexible whenever you need it. So any type in Swift is customizable, which means instead of having you know, int defined by a standard library, you could define it yourself um, and also methods that could extend it. Uh, I mentioned before that TPUs require something very special called bfloat16. Um, this is great for them in the sense that, uh, in the sense that that no longer becomes a pain um, to deal with in a, in a programming language. You can, just, uh, you can just create that custom type and use it as you desire. Um, we also have language integrated autodiff, so that at differentiable that I was showing before that you can use to preface any function. Um, and that, uh, that, as I mentioned, is in the process of being upstreamed to Swift core. Performance, always fun. So Swift has very speedy low-level performance, often just as fast as you would get with C, which is crazy, but also awesome. Um, we have thread-level scalability without the gill, um, automatic graph execution, um, and performance parity with C and C++. And these are all in support of those algorithmic fusion techniques that I was mentioning before. Um, recently, we delivered a, a series of workshops with Jeremy Howard and Rachel Thomas. You can see them on the screen there. Um, specifically focused on why Swift is a game changer for machine learning um, and why, uh, what the timeline was for implementation. And what you can see is, uh, if, you, if you watch these, these very in-depth workshops, is that Jeremy, who is very much a Python person, who kind of famously transitioned from using TensorFlow Core to using PyTorch, particularly because of speed, um, has since migrated back to TensorFlow, specifically for Swift for TensorFlow, um, because the, the performance that he required from PyTorch wasn't there. Um, and he's been really excited to, to try and build out a library um, using Swift that would be just as, as sort of understandable and, and fun to use as this fast AI implementation in Python. So we've also worked um, at DeepMind with the Alpha Zero team um, and the Alpha Go team. The, how many of you have, have sort of heard of the work that those folks have been doing? It's, it's mostly the, the thing that they're most famous for, I believe, is um, creating an implementation of Go that could beat a human, right? And the, something that not a lot of folks know is that model wasn't, um, even though it's a deep learning model, that model was not developed in Python. Um, they were actually, in order to get the flexibility that they needed, they needed to implement the entire thing using C++, uh, which again, is very painful um, and did not really lead to rapid prototyping as, as quickly as they had hoped. Um, we were able to work with this team at DeepMind and re-implement um, re Alpha Zero just as performant as C++ and a fraction of the number of lines of code um, just over the course of a, about a week when we were there for their engineering extravaganza. Uh, so that was very cool to see and really fun to work with, um, really fun to work with the team. 
Um, that's just an example of, of the combination of three technologies that were required to implement AlphaGo Zero. Um, so deep learning, Monte Carlo tree search, sort of that algorithmic fusion that I was talking about before, and high performance TPUs. And if you mix all of those things together, um, it plays a lot nicer with a typed language than it would with Python. Um, we've also worked um, in a reinforcement learning context to implement OpenSpiel, which is uh, games with imperfect information. So you might, uh, you might recognize poker, um, backgammon, a, a couple of others. Um, many, of those, uh, many of those algorithms are implemented in Swift, um, and if you would like to try them out today, you absolutely can. The paper is being presented at NeurIPS later this year, I believe, um, as well as a workshop. We've also been um, sort of exploring, uh, exploring some ideas about deployment to mobile and embedded devices. Um, and none of, uh, you know, these are, this is still very, very early stage work, um, but you can imagine that uh, it would be very interesting to deploy machine learning models and doing a sort of live training on device that would not be afforded with, with something like Python. So what do I mean by this? Right, like uh, so, f in every um, in every Pixel device, there's a model for adaptive brightness um, that might be trained on a massive amount of data on servers somewhere, um, and then deployed to device. But then it fine tunes preferences based on how I interact with my cell phone. Right, so so it might notice that whenever I pull up my ebook reader at seven o'clock p.m. and it's dark outside. Um, I might uh, turn down the brightness. Um, or it might notice that whenever I pull up Spotify as I'm walking along down the street, um, I, might, uh, I might make the brightness a, a, little, bit, uh, a little bit more in the, if there's you know, sort of ambient lux, that's uh, ambient brightness um, that's a specific amount. Right? And it learns those behaviors over time based on kind of the color of the app, the color of, uh, or the, the sort of brightness in the room, the time of day, you know, uh, whether, I'm, uh, whether I'm at my house versus elsewhere, those sorts of things. And all of those personal customizations go into creating a hyper-personalized model just for me, um, as opposed to the model that was implemented on tons and tons of user data somewhere in a server. Um, but you can, that is one example. Um, nest temperature control is also another one. Um, so it might notice that whenever you get to your house, uh, you turn down the temperature, you turn it up, um, and it's usually at a certain time given the day of the week, uh, and you could automatically start anticipating those needs of your customers. Um, the list goes on, right? So, uh, so hearing aids, um, people have hearing aids that are often paired to mobile devices, um, being able to make those customizations immediately instead of having a person do it um, is really powerful, or being able to recommend personalized insulin levels. Um, if you're if you're uh, a diabetic and you have um, if you have a pack, so so this is really uh, this is really exciting to us, um, and we're uh, like sort of exploring this actively. Um, if you have ideas, we would love to hear them, um, especially at the Swift Open Design meetings. We had a couple just recently about reducing the binary size, um, and also sort of building performant quantized models uh, that you might be uh, that might be fun to check out. And developer tooling, so not sacrificing any of your favorite developer products, right? You can import Python modules just as you would, um, just as you would in Python itself. You can display plots inline. Um, you uh, you can have user-defined types, and there's also support um, in VS Code. So this is uh, one of the Swift extensions, um, and you can see the nice features like semantic aware autocomplete. Um, there and it works just as expected, um, quite nice, uh, especially if you've been playing with some of the the, the Python um, the Python extensions. Future directions: AD um, complete and being upstream to mobile and embedded devices, generic arguments, C++ interop, um, concurrency and ownership. Uh, so so all of those things are, are very near and dear to our hearts and we would love to have collaboration. The project is open source um, and all of our development is done on GitHub. Uh, so if you want to get involved, it's super easy to do so. Um, and Swift for TensorFlow, as I mentioned, part of the TensorFlow organization. 
Um, we have a number of uh, Jupyter notebooks that are available for you to test out. All of them are runnable. Um, so you just shift enter your, to your heart's content and all of the cells, uh, all of the cells execute immediately. No need for um, sort of any specialized compilation if you're operating from a Jupyter notebook. Um, you can stay informed by joining our mailing list at swift at tensorflow.org. Um, we have a, a page on the TensorFlow website. Um, and then we also have GitHub, which is far and away the, the, most, active, the most active place to take a look. Um, so Swift models, Swift APIs, Swift, um, and Swift docs are, are all really uh, interesting locations to check out. Um, and we'll have another open design meeting this Friday at 9 a.m. Um, if anybody's interested in attending. So with that, I believe that is it. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I'm really enjoying learning a little bit more about QCon and the, the kind of problems that y'all are tackling. Um, and if anybody has questions, feel free to ask them. I think I have some time left over. No questions. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. Paige, jealous of Julia. Oh, that's a great question. Um, and also very punny. I, I appreciate the So, so uh, Julia is a, is a programming language um, that is also re, uh, seen considerable traction in the machine learning space. Um, but it, it's not as well integrated with some of the deployment scenarios um, as, as, uh, as one would like. We, one of the things that at least I've found most interesting about Swift, right, is that you can create one model um, and have it deployable to any sort of architecture, whereas right now the, the process seems to be you create a model in Python, um, you might export it to a saved model format if it's implemented in TensorFlow, which could then be uh, sort of converted into a TF Lite mo uh, model if you want to run it on an Android device, or you could use CoreML to, uh, to port it to a, a, a sort of format that would be useful to an iPhone. Um, but in, in the end, you end up with these like very awkward sort of parallel deployment pipelines where you might have custom logic for doing data pre-processing um, on device, and that's in one language, which might be Kotlin if it's Android, or it might be Swift if it's iPhone. Um, and then you have the, the sort of logic that comprises the model, and then you have the logic that needs to happen in order to give an output back to your user. Um, and all of those things are in very different sort of languages um, and very difficult to maintain over time. Like you might make a change to the main model and it might um, not be recognized downstream. Um, or you might see different performance for both of those two, uh, like for Android devices versus iPhone devices. So part of the magic of Swift is that you can implement the model in Swift, you can export it, um, or compile it down and export it, um, and then just, if you're on an iPhone, use Swift, um, or if you're on a server, use Swift, um, or, if you're, uh, or if you're on a sort of Android device, you can have the user interface implemented in Kotlin, um, but just be calling Swift as a library. So Julia, I, I don't believe it's super popular in terms of um, sort of server-side support or uh, mobile device uh, application building or, or those sorts of things. And that was, that was really important to us. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask, so um, could you maybe elaborate a bit on auto differentiation, how it's different in in Swift for TensorFlow. So what, what does the compiler do? What's the magic there? Right, so, so I'm probably going to get this horribly wrong, um, but what the compiler is able to do um, is it's able to, uh, to sort of understand what the, what the change, um, it's, it's able to understand what you're attempting to do in your function um, and do a lot of the, a lot of the work, um, a lot of the work for you as opposed to you having to build out something like a gradient tape. So I'm not sure how many of you have, have uh, experimented with TensorFlow 2.0 um, or TensorFlow in general. Um, but, the, but the way that differentiation works in that scenario is that you, you, create a, um, you create a gradient tape, which essentially collects your variables 
um, as you plug and chug along and, and get the change over time. Um, and then that's either, uh, that's sort of exposed to you um, at the very end or, uh, or periodically as, as, the, the processing, um, as the processing is done. Um, or in PyTorch, it's, it's through something called lazy tensor. Um, but, the, but the way that Swift works um, is that you don't, really have, uh, you don't really have to think about the concept of building a tape. Um, and you don't really have to think about you know, collecting your variables over time. All of that's, uh, all of that's done by the compiler for you, um, which makes life a great deal easier. Last chance for questions? Mm -hmm. Three, two, one. Excellent. Well, then thank you very much, Paige. Thank you.